Sup, Chooms? How y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. So, in our righteous crusade against the Slaphead Curse, the first line of defense should always be a 5-AR inhibiting drug like Finasteride. We know this because at the moment, the safest and most effective way to control DHT on the scalp is through blocking the 5-AR pathway through pharmaceutical interventions that prevent testosterone from being converted into the evil trash hormone DHT, which is of course, like I said, the evil hormone that destroys hair follicles on the scalps of men who are genetically predisposed to androgenic alopecia. In the rare event a 5-AR inhibitor by itself is not enough, the next strategy is to add a growth stimulant. And since the 1980s, the most effective and safe growth stimulant has been 5% topical minoxidil. Now, Minoxidil isn't an effective standalone treatment for long-term use since it doesn't target hair loss through an androgenic mechanism the way finasteride does. But where minoxidil really shines is as an adjunct to finasteride. Minoxidil has several theories beha behind how it works, but we know that despite some preliminary in vitro research, minoxidil probably doesn't have any significant hormonal mechanism of action. One way we know this is because minoxidil can promote body and facial hair growth, which drugs that lower DHT like finasteride Right, don't do because DHT paradoxically is beneficial at growing hairs outside of the scalp. So when a patient takes finasteride alongside minoxidil, this allows minoxidil to work more effectively since the finasteride will be suppressing DHT while minoxidil will act as a general growth stimulant for the hair on the scalp. Now, I want to emphasize that these two treatments, especially when used together, will stop or reverse hair loss in the overwhelming majority of people who use it. Even finasteride alone is remarkably effective. For example, in a study of over 500 Japanese men with androgenic alopecia followed for 10 years on 1 milligram per day of finasteride, there was improvement in hair growth in 92% of men and prevention of the disease progression in 99% of them even after 10 years of use. And I made a video about this, which I'll link below. The fact is, though, is that the majority of people who claim that finasteride or finasteride plus minoxidil are not working for them are people who are misinterpreting a shed as a sign that drug isn't working, which is probably the most common mistake people make when fighting hair loss, and I also did a video on shedding, which I'll link below. The fundamental reason for shedding is that both finasteride and minoxidil shorten the telogen resting phase and lengthen the antigen growth phase, so that there's usually an increase in shedding when first starting these drugs because a greater than usual number of telogen phase hairs are shed, and then after that, the hair phases are more synchronized than usual, so that periods of increased shedding can occur from time to time even though the drugs are absolutely working. The other reason people think these drugs aren't working is that they have unrealistic expectations about the drug and expect regrowth when sometimes regrowth is not possible, especially if the patient is too far gone. And the best thing they can hope for at that point is just maintenance and maybe just a little bit of hair regrowth. However, based on clinical trials, we know that like any drug, there's going to be a very small segment of non-responders. And it could be that some of these people just have such aggressive androgenic alopecia that the traditional finasteride plus minoxidil stack is not enough for them. Fortunately, there are stronger options for such individuals. In the case of 5-AR inhibitors, one could always elect to use dutasteride, which is stronger than finasteride, even at 0.5 milligrams per day. And furthermore, dutasteride can be titrated safely all the way up to 2.5 milligrams per day, which I talk about in my video on dutasteride dosing, which I'll link below. However, when it comes to growth stimulants, many hair loss witchers have simply been shit out of luck. 5% minoxidil is the strongest growth stimulant on the market. Higher concentrations of minoxidil, like 10 and 15% minoxidil, do exist. But surprisingly, these concentrations of minoxidil actually don't work as well for the majority of users. And I made a video about higher concentrations of minoxidil, which I'll link below. But to sum up the research on higher concentrations of minoxidil, they only work better in people who are poor responders to 5% minoxidil. People who are poor responders to 5% minoxidil Minoxidil, though, don't need to use 10 or 15% minoxidil. Rather, what they can do is they can try using 0.01% tretinoin, which increases the levels of the sulfotransferized enzyme on the scalp, which converts minoxidil into its active form called minoxidil sulfate. However, even when other interventions are added, there are going to be some people who are just flat out, they just can't use minoxidil because they're allergic or maybe they get side effects. So what are the options then for someone who wants to use a growth stimulant, but they can't use minoxidil? Well, 
While there are other growth stimulants out there on the market, most of these are just derivatives of minoxidil, though only weaker and with less clinical data, so they're not viable alternatives to minoxidil. There is also stimoxidine, which is unique in that it is a growth stimulant that works completely differently from minoxidil and thus can even be stacked with it, but directly compared to minoxidil, it doesn't grow more hair than even 2% minoxidil. And I actually created a video where I directly compared minoxidil and stimoxidine together, and I'll link that video below if you want to learn more about stimoxidine. But anyways, how is it that since the 1980s, we don't have a growth stimulant that is at least on par with minoxidil? Everything in development for androgenic alopecia that is on the horizon either targets androgenic alopecia by tackling DHT or by going after the downstream effects of DHT, such as the WNT wind pathway drugs, all of which I have covered on this channel. That's great, of course, but what about what is available now? All we pretty much have in terms of growth stimulants are just minoxidil and stimoxidine, at least in the case of growth stimulants which actually work. Everything else out there isn't even worth its weight in broccoli. Or am I wrong? Well... As it turns out, a hair loss witcher in the comments section yesterday brought to my attention some research about a supplement called N-acetylcysteine, or NAC, which supposedly works as well as minoxidil, but without any side effects. Sounds great, right? Of course, I am of the mindset that if something sounds too good to be true, it usually is. But these claims are backed by clinical research, not just anecdotes. So before we jump to any conclusions about NAC and its purported benefits, let's go ahead and go balls deep and see if we can make any sense of this research. Now, NAC is very interesting because it is a real drug used for very legitimate medical indications, but it's also sold as a supplement, which usually means people are using it for indications that haven't been proven. But since the FDA doesn't regulate supplements, other than asking the supplement manufacturers not to make strong medical claims about their products, people end up using them for all sorts of bogus reasons without any medical research supporting these uses. The FDA regulates medical supplements as food and not as medicine, and so these supplements are not tested the way medicines are, and unlike with pharmaceutical supplements, companies can get away with making false health claims about their products. And if you think Big Pharma is just in for the money, Big Supplement, also known as Big Plus SIBO, was valued at $140.3 billion dollars in 2020 alone, which isn't small change, of course, and many promoters of these bullshit supplements like Dr. Mercola have earned hundreds of millions of dollars selling worthless remedies like collodial silver or tanning beds that he claims actually help prevent skin cancer. So I'm not saying that Big Pharma is perfect, but it is very hypocritical to criticize the profit motives of pharmaceutical companies while ignoring the vast amounts of money big placebo pushers make. For all its flaws, at least pharmaceuticals are subject to strong regulation, unlike the health claims made about supplements, which are usually just anecdotal and not backed up by any clinical research whatsoever. But NAC is both a medication and a supplement, so at least it has gone through FDA testing. It was first approved for medical use in 1968, and since that was a long time ago, it is off patent, meaning it is available as a generic medication and is therefore pretty cheap. But its approved use as a medication is pretty limited. Its main use is for people with severe chronic obstructive lung disease or pneumonia, which I guess might include COVID patients nowadays too. It is inhaled as a mist, making it easier for patients to cough up phlegm. It is also used to treat Tylenol overdose where it is given intravenously. It has also been used to treat a specific form of epilepsy. Interestingly, it has a lot of potential uses in psychiatry and some of these indications are backed by good data, but some are more speculative as well. It has been used in bipolar disorder, depression, schizophrenia, Alzheimer's disease, anxiety disorders, and even autism. It has been tried in addiction disorders including drug and alcohol addiction, excessive of marijuana use and even gambling addiction. However, from what I have read about it, it has not been proven to be that helpful in these addiction disorders. One hair-related condition it has been used to treat is for something called trichotillomania, which is when people compulsively pull out their hairs. A famous example of someone with trichotillomania is the YouTuber Shoe on Head, whom I think has admitted to occasionally wearing wigs to cover it up. And I'll link an article on the research below on trichotillomania if you are interested in learning more about that condition. But the reason it has been used in neurologic and psychiatric psychiatric conditions is that it affects glutamate and dopamine neurotransmitters, but that is not an effect that would be important for treating hair loss. So what is the proposed mechanism for NAC regrowing your hair? Well, 
Besides its neurological effects, NAC is an antioxidant. Now, you may have heard about antioxidants because antioxidants are compounds that neutralize oxidants, also known as reactive oxygen species, or ROS. These oxidants are very destructive to all the cells in the body, so the antioxidants found in food are important in protecting our cells from these harmful substances. But why would an antioxidant help grow hair, especially in people with androgenic alopecia, which we know is due to the effects of DHT on hair follicles that are genetically susceptible to destruction from DHT? Well. There is some evidence that the levels of oxidants are higher in young men with early onset androgenic alopecia compared to healthy men with normal hair. In this study of 33 androgenic alopecia patients versus 30 controls, levels of destructive oxidants were higher and levels of antioxidants were lower in the blood of men with alopecia than in normal men. However, in this study, the researchers really didn't have a good explanation for why these oxidant and antioxidant imbalances were seen. Well, another group of researchers found another link between antioxidants and androgenic alopecia. This link has to do with prostaglandins. Prostaglandins, what they are, are, they are a group of substances that act somewhat like hormones in the body. And I did a video on prostaglandins, which I'll link below. But the bottom line on prostaglandins is that even though prostaglandin modulating treatments for hair loss have never been proven to be very effective, it has nevertheless been found that the prostaglandin D2, also known as PGD2, is known to inhibit hair growth, and it has been found in the scalps of men with androgenic alopecia. Another prostaglandin, PGE2, is a hair growth stimulant, and it's levels have been found to be low in the scalps of people with androgenic alopecia. Now, the exact link between these prostaglandin level changes and the effects of DHT hasn't been worked out yet, but these prostaglandin changes may be downstream effects stimulated by DHT in the hair follicles. So, what is the link between prostaglandins and antioxidants like NAC? Well, a study from 2017 titled, quote, Prostaglandin D2 uses components of ROS signaling to enhance testosterone production in keratinocytes, unquote, looked at this. What these researchers did is they took human keratinocytes, which are just basic human skin cells, and they added PGD2 or PGE2 to these cells in a tissue bath. They then added androstenedione, dione, which is a weak androgen, and it is one of the precursors in the body for the synthesis of testosterone. The researchers found that in the cells given PGD2, there was increased production of testosterone compared to the cells given PGE2, or just an inert solution, which you can see in this figure right here. The the inert solution is labeled DMSO, and you can see there is more testosterone production with PGD2 than with PGE2. So the investigators weren't sure the exact mechanism for the increased testosterone production, but they suspected it had something to do with the fact that PGD2 induces reactive oxygen species like we just talked about. These reactive oxygen species can cause a lot of cellular damage, and like I said, they may play a role in the destruction of the hair follicles in androgenic alopecia-sensitive men. So the investigators wondered whether these reactive oxygen species or oxidants might trigger the increase in testosterone production that they saw in in this study. So in order to test this, they added N-acetylcysteine and found that indeed NAC blocked the increase in testosterone production. You can see this in this graph here. PGD2 increased testosterone production by itself, but PGD2 plus NAC had no effect on testosterone production. The researchers concluded that antioxidants like NAC might be useful in treating androgenic alopecia. They say, quote, High BGD2 levels found in the bald scalp of AGA patients may indirectly lead to increased testosterone, which can be converted into dihydrotestosterone by 5A reductases a function that will further drive hair loss, unquote. So PGD2 is like a positive feedback loop or a vicious cycle. DHT in the hair follicles may increase the production of PGD2, which releases destructive reactive oxygen species, but also may locally increase testosterone levels, and that may lead to more DHT production by the conversion of testosterone into DHT via the 5AR enzyme. But maybe antioxidants like NAC can interrupt this vicious cycle. Well, now that brings us to the study that was published most recently titled, quote, Efficacy and Tolerability of N-Acetylcysteine for the Treatment of the Early Onset Androgenic Alopecia in Men, unquote. 
Well, the website presents a summary of the study, but not a lot of details. So I went ahead searching for the original article, and usually I'll check websites like Sci-Hub or do an extensive Google search, and I can usually find the original article. As a last resort, though, I'll go ahead and pay the highway robbery fees charged by the medical publishers to read an article, which can range anywhere from $30 to $70, which is, of course, completely ridiculous, but whatever it takes to bring you Chum's quality research, I'm willing to do that. Well, fortunately, I did find the original article without needing to pay any money, but disappointingly, the original article is exactly the same as the summary. It turns out this article was published as an abstract, which means it is a preliminary publication that lacks details and has not undergone peer review yet. Abstracts like this are usually presented at medical conferences as slideshows or as posters, so anyone who went to the medical meeting might know more details, but none of that is available at the moment, but hopefully soon the full data will, be, will be actually be published. So, anyways... This abstract is very limited in detail, but we also have a description of the study on the website clinicaltrials.gov. From this site and from the abstract, we know that this was a randomized trial that involved 100 subjects who were aged anywhere from 18 to 30 years old. Then these subjects had mild to moderate androgenic alopecia up to Norwood 4. The study was done at a single center in Egypt, and the analysis of the results was blinded, meaning someone interpreted the trichogram results without knowing which treatment the subjects were on. The subjects were divided into four groups. One group got topical minoxidil 5% twice a day. One group got NAC 600 milligrams orally three times per day. One group got both minoxidil and NAC combined. And one group got no treatment at all. The study lasted four months. The results were assessed by using standard photographs at the start of the study and after four months. Trichograms were used to do hair counts, including terminal hair counts and vellus hair counts. Patient satisfaction was measured using a score of 0 to 2, and side effects were monitored. Unfortunately, like I said, the results in the publication are very sketchy. All treatments improved significantly, quote, some, unquote, of the trichoscopic parameters compared to the control group. Terminal hair counts increased and vellus hair counts decreased with each of the treatments. The improvements were in both the vertex and frontotemporal areas of the scalp. The side effects were supposedly minor. The investigators concluded, quote, and acetylcysteine improved significantly most of the trichoscopic features of androgenic alopecia, and it was generally tolerable, and the side effects encountered did not necessitate stoppage of the treatment course, unquote. So this is all pretty vague. It looks like NAC works better than placebo, at least, but it's impossible to tell if it is as good or better or worse than minoxidil. It's also not clear if the combination of NAC and minoxidil was better than either drug alone. And even if NAC was better than placebo, placebo, we don't know how big of an effect it has. So I think at best, NAC could be comparable to minoxidil, because if it were better than minoxidil, I'm sure the researchers would have said that in their abstract. So I really doubt that NAC is going to replace minoxidil, and I think we'll be lucky if it is even close to as effective as minoxidil, but we'll have to wait and see. So we'll see hopefully soon if an antioxidant like NAC really is a third validated way to treat androgenic alopecia in addition to the proven therapies of finasteride and minoxidil. I doubt NAC will play a major role, but for the time being, this one is at least worth keeping an eye on. In the meantime, though, make sure you don't screw around with theory. Make sure you stick with what is proven to work and keep fighting the good fight, my fellow hair loss witchers. It was good talking to you again, and I'll see you next time. Take care.